find the perfect home for us, my dream house. And somebody else would say, and, uh, and then I met my perfect partner. And somebody said, I found my dream job. And at the bottom, you would have to have a disclaimer that said, <laughs> individual results may vary. The treatments described in the video were used in conjunction with extreme large doses of faith. <laughs> and they would be, would be legally safe. But wouldn't it be nice if you could take a faith increase in pill? So if you come with instructions, this is take two capsules 10 minutes before your prayer session. That would be good. So the, the basic idea here is we know we have something that works. We know that a pretty much a prayer works. Yet it works better for some people than for others. And that's in any area of life. But today, and just to make it to narrow it down, we're going to talk about how this happens in the life area of wealth. So um, let me start by sharing with you how feng shui, you know, my main business is feng shui, and how feng shui defines wealth. I have this is funny because I have done a, a lot of workshops and I have had booths in different events for spirituality and uh, new thought uh, kind of events. And uh, especially healers, you know, when they start learning about feng shui, they will ask me, so what is this crystal for? And I would say, well, that is for the welfare of your home. And they would tell me, well, my family and my friends are my wealth. Or they would say, well, my spirituality is my wealth. And then I would tell them, no, 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 no. In feng shui, we have a separate area for family and friends. And we have a separate area for spirituality. When we're talking about wealth, we are talking about material possessions. But see, we live in a culture where we have um, been programmed from our faith systems to believe that it's somehow evil to acquire wealth. In a Judeo-Christian belief, there's a, there are a lot of reference that if you're a rich person, you are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But also, at the same time, in the same traditions, a lot of the examples for people, say like in the Bible, a lot of the examples of people who uh, were favored by God were also very wealthy people. You know, we know that Abraham was very wealthy. And there's a, there's a lot of examples of uh, very wealthy people in the Bible. So this is sort of a contradiction, isn't it? That on the one hand, you're being told if you are wealthy, you are not going to get into heaven. And on the other, on the other hand, you're being told that uh, you're being shown examples of uh, people who are favored by God who are wealthy. But let's go back to that definition of wealth. So wealth is an abundance of material possessions. It's definitely that, an abundance of material possessions. It is also an abundance of skills and knowledge. And it is also an abundance of connections. And here I don't mean an abundance of friends. I mean knowing enough influential people in your community. That is what makes wealth. So let me repeat that. An abundance of material possessions, an abundance of skills and knowledge, and an abundance of connections. So it seems to me that every person knows in their heart that all you have to do in life is ask and you shall receive. The reason I say this is it seems to me it's virtually impossible to go through life without experiencing at this one serendipitous moment or some uh, synchronicity moment that feels sort of like a miracle. And I think that is true for any person in a, you know, people who are born in really good conditions, people who are born in, a, in very extreme poor conditions. Everybody, you cannot go through life without at some point sensing that when you really want something, you get it. Or when you really desire something, you get it. And um, I would venture to say that any person would also know at some level that material wealth, any kind of material wealth, is also accessible if they just ask for it. So why don't we? Uh, you know now that in the United States, the Occupy movement is all over the place, and there's a lot of discussions whether the Occupy movement is legitimate or not, and whether they should be allowed to demonstrate or not. And there are a lot of spiritual uh, people who have commented on the Occupy movement. And uh, a friend was telling me about her, her master and uh, a guru, of, uh, a yogi guru, was saying that he estimates that only about 2% of people in the world have a healthy wealth consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, that seems to you know be expressed in this maybe not two percent or ninety eight percent, but we're talking about the nine percent. 99% versus the 1%. But what is causing it? Is it really our social mechanisms or is the lack of ability of people to postulate wealth for themselves? I think that's an interesting spiritual question. And um, I want to tell you a horror story. Who here likes horror stories? Not me, <laughs> but I used to love them when I was younger. You know, Edgar Allan Poe was on my, one of my favorite writers. So this is a horror story about a, a couple that get a hold of a rabbit's paw. And the rabbit's paw is supposed to be good luck, right? You see them sold in certain markets. But this one was especially powerful. In this one, you had to only, you could only get three wishes from this rabbit's paw. So the woman, and it was a, a mature couple, <coughs> the woman says, um, picks up the rabbit's paw, even though they had warned her that it had brought nothing but unhappiness to the previous owner. She goes ahead and uses it, and she says, she says I want $140,000. For some reason, you know, she came up with that number. And within a week later, there's a knock on her door, and a check for $140,000 is delivered because her son died in combat, and the government is compensating the parents with $140,000. So they bring the body of the son, there's a funeral, he is buried really close to the house. And um, the, the wife is torn, she feels like what she, what she did caused the death of her son because she wanted this money and she asked the rabbit paw, rabbit paw for it that she was punished with the death of her son. So she does what any reasonable mother would, she grabs the rabbit paw again and she says, I want my son back. And she goes to sleep. And that night, you hear this, all these sounds of scratching and boards being torn and all sorts of strange noises in the night. And they had a They were a very fearful couple, so they had seven locks on their door. And so then they hear this banging, like a zombie banging on the, on the door. And she says, it's my son, it's my son, come back from the dead. And she runs. And she's desperately trying to open the seven locks, and then her husband runs to the mantelpiece over um, the fireplace and grabs the rabbit's paw and makes one last wish, so that when she opens the door, there's nothing there. So you know what the last wish was, right? And I think that in Western society, this mentality that you are going to be seriously punished for wanting more wealth is widespread. So I, I've started uh, calling this in my mind the rabbit's paw phenomenon. And uh, I have mentioned in different lectures that I see the universe as God's butler, and God has ordered the butler to tend to us as the, as the most special, precious guests, and that whatever we want, we should be given. And the universe comply, complies. So if the universe is programmed to give us everything that we ask for, if this is true, then the only possible answer to that question is that we are stopping it. If God is delivering and we are not getting it, we are stopping it. So because we're talking about wealth, I'm going to give you the most common examples that I have found with working with clients and from my studies. What are the eight things? And there are really actually four, but I have subdivided them. Um, the major blocks for wealth. What do we do in our lives to prevent us from experiencing more abundance? And so, the most, the, to the most common ones, one is family conditioning or poverty consciousness. You know, when, uh, when you were a child, maybe you wanted everything you saw. And you say, I want that, I want that. And maybe your parents told you, I don't have any money, I don't have any money. And this may or may not have been true, but what was the intent of telling you? And they say, I want that toy. And they tell you, I don't have any money. The intent was to shut you up, right? That was the intent. So maybe your parents had a lot of money, maybe they didn't have a lot of money, but the intent was to get you to stop asking for something. So I'm very careful of not doing that with my children. Or they might have told you we cannot afford that. Or maybe you saw your parents have an unhealthy relationship to money. Maybe you saw that your parents were not able to control their spending. Or maybe your parents believed that being wealthy was bad. Or 
It could be that when you were sitting at dinner at home, your family members could be speaking ill of uh, some neighbors that were richer. And you grow up with this idea that having wealth would separate you from the people you love. Then uh, the second most common, wealth for wealth are religious beliefs. And uh, that I touched upon a little bit earlier, their beliefs that wealth is basically bad, or that becoming wealthy is gonna make you a bad person. And what I have seen actually happens is that wealth exacerbates what the person already is. So if the person is petty and mean, having more resources allows them to express their meanness and pettiness in heightened ways, right? But if the person is good and generous and kind, having more resources is going to be expressed in being able to be more generous, more kind, and more loving. So it's, it's interesting, you know, that um, ever since I was very young, I got interested in the Eastern, especially uh, traditional Chinese thought, of which Buddhism is not a part. Traditional Chinese thought comes from the teachings of Lao Tse, mainly, you know, the Tao Te Ching, and the teachings of the I Ching, which are, which are very concurrent with the teachings of Confucius. And I was always very interested in that, and this is, um, it's a philosophy of life that comes from observing life. And they don't have um, any misgivings about wealth, because in their tradition, what being wealthy is what comes naturally. Wealth is often compared to a healthy forest. So in a healthy forest, what would happen? The trees would be a little bit thicker every year, so more wood, right? They'd be a little bit taller, the roots would be deeper. Uh, the wildlife would multiply. So it is natural for a person who is in business or in a profession that every year they would accumulate more stuff and that every year they would have more connections, they would have met more people. Through the practice of their business or their profession, they would have met more people. And uh, the more they do their profession or the more they work on their business, the more they know about it. It's natural to acquire wealth. So when a person is not able to say, I have more this year than I had last year, unless something really dramatic happened. Something is not working right in their lives. So another block for wealth is debt. That seems pretty obvious, right? If you owe money, you're not going to feel comfortable about the idea of wealth. But this is the most interesting thing, is that spiritually, the little debt weighs more than the big debt. So say a man called Tim owes $100,000 to one person, and he owes $10 to his neighbor. Which one is the biggest block for the development of wealth? And is the $10 one. Can you tell me why? He has to avoid his neighbor. He has to avoid his neighbor. But um, let's say that he owes $100,000 to one neighbor and $10 to the other neighbor. Maybe he has terms on the 100000 and so it's pretty clearly laid out. Maybe um, it is, maybe it isn't. You know, yes. like if you have a mortgage, you're paying the mortgage, so you would feel comfortable because you don't owe, uh, you're not late on your payments. That makes a lot of sense. But the basic reason is that he can pay the $10. He cannot pay the $100,000, but he can pay the $10. And if he chooses not to pay the $10, he's blocking his growth of wealth. The other one is guilt. If a person, for whatever reasons, feels guilty, if they feel they have done something that is against their own ethics rules, that is also going to stop their ability to create wealth. Another two big ones are the IRS. Now, messing with the IRS is a big block to wealth in the United States. And uh, music. And I'll tell you why. First, you know, messing with the IRS, not paying taxes. A lot of people in the United States have told me that they don't believe in paying taxes because taxes are not constitutional. When the country was founded, they were not supposed to pay federal, federal tax or income tax, right? And, um, and so they find all sorts of ways to avoid paying taxes. And what that does, it creates an unconscious fear of the IRS. And the IRS is very powerful. You don't want to mess with the IRS. I don't care if the IRS is right or not. You do not want to make an enemy of the IRS. 
So that makes sense, right? And, um, you know, I met this um, a newspaper owner who lived in the Midwest. And uh, we were approaching, I was working for this newspaper, we were approaching the busiest time of the year, which is around Christmas. And he said, oh, I have to go to Mexico. And I said, why would you want to go to Mexico when there's not much to do? He said, because my accountant told me that I'm getting dangerously close to showing a profit. <laughs> so as long as I make a couple of business calls in Mexico, <coughs> I'll be able to deduct $3,600 from my taxes. And I said, why do you do that? And, she said, and he said, because I don't, as long as I only declare a profit every five years, I don't have to pay taxes. But also his business is not growing. So that, that doesn't make sense, you know. And notice that he wasn't saying, oh, you know, I need to, because my accountant has told me that I'm close to declaring a profit, I'm going to buy equipment so I can produce more the next year. You know, he was going on vacation, I was going to write that off as an expense. But this idea of not declaring profit hurts a person's consciousness. The other one is music, you know, and then here there's a lot of people wouldn't agree with me on this. <laughs> Say for example, my, my main business is feng shui, but I also teach Zumba. It's a hobby, but I get paid, you know, when I go to the gym and I teach my Zumba classes, I get paid for that. And uh, there's other Zumba teachers that just exchange music, and I just cannot do that, you know, I, whenever, if I'm going to get paid to do something, especially, I'm going to pay for it. Why? Because I see it as something that goes against ethics rules. For another person who doesn't see it as something that goes against ethics rules, it might not become a block for wealth. But I know it would be for me. See, so I control that. Um, other blocks for wealth are feelings of unworthiness, you know, like low self-esteem, and the fear of success. Um, I have met people who just could not believe. They, they were made to feel so bad about themselves when they were growing up that they just could not believe that they could have a comfortable life. And these people, you know, some of these people were actually really good at making money, but they also, to compensate, became really good at losing money. So the person might, might end up, you know, with that, an extra $30,000 one year and invest that in a bad business. I actually met somebody who did this invest all that money in a bad business the next year and lose 40000 So a person extremely able to make money, but more efficient at losing money because of feelings of unworthiness, feelings that they did not deserve to have a comfortable life. And another, uh, the eighth one that I'm going to share with you is hoarding is a block for wealth. Because when you are keeping things that you don't use, that you don't love, that are broken, you are cluttering your life. You're given too much stuff that you don't use. It's like, uh, like throwing a, you know, like this trust, this universal trust that's coming down the highway with all these blessings for you, and you keep throwing boulders on the road so that they cannot reach you. And uh, so in Feng Shui we say, keep only the things that you use, you love, and that are in good condition. So, um, in order to deal with all these blocks that we might have for wealth, I have devised a tool, you know, which, again, I came up with it, but no invention is purely ours. I was inspired by something that uh, was recommended in the movie The Secret, and then uh, by my philosophies, um, called the vision board. Who here has ever got a vision board? Yeah. So in the vision board, you make a collage of whatever you would like to see in your life, whatever you would like to be manifest in your life. In the wealth poster, we are very focused. We just put stuff. You make a collage of all the stuff you want. And um, you, um, you can start with a list. You know, sometimes it's easier to do it with a list. But you can just go ahead and go directly into the collage. It's important that on the wealth poster that you place very expensive things, very inexpensive things and all the ranges in between. And the more stuff you put on your wall poster, the faster you get things. It is unbelievable when people use this tool. You'll see them a year later, and they have gotten so many things. And their income did not grow, 
It's, it's, it's like a mystery. They're infinite in growth, but yet they have all the things that they desire. And my children are avid users of the golf poster. So whenever they come and tell me, I want this mama, I tell her, okay. I tell them, okay, cut out that picture from the catalog and put it on your golf poster. I don't tell them we cannot afford it, or I don't have the money, or I don't think it's a good choice, and I tell them just cut it out and put it on your golf poster. So it is a tool to help us uh, visualize the material goods that we want. It, um, it works really well. You know, there was um, a person, I didn't actually meet this woman, I met her friend. And uh, he had, um, she had visualized that she was going to get a Jaguar. And she had put a poster of a Jaguar. And this was not actually a wealth poster, you know, but just a poster of a Jaguar that she wanted. And the day that she actually bought it, there was a scratch on the door, and she opened the door, and the cat came in, the black cat, and sat on her couch and stayed forever. And then a little while later, she realized when she was going to take down the poster that there was a black cat on the poster. So the things that we visualize tend to come to us faster. And it's also important to put your wealth poster on a place that's very visible. It's very important that you ask for things, not for the money to buy the things, because some of them might come as gifts, uh, yard sales, and all sorts of different things. And to counteract this idea that something bad can happen to us, you know, the rabbit's paw syndrome, the idea that if we ask for something we want, that we're going to get punished, we write at the top or on the back the following phrase. From highest good for, from highest source for highest good. From highest source for highest good. That is how we counteract this idea that we might get punished or something bad may happen to us because we're wanting things. And we are material beings, we need material things. It's, I'm not saying we should be, become the focus of our lives to get stuff, but we have a right to have things and we have a right to enjoy them. And uh, if you go to my website, there's a, a lot more explanations on how to create and work a wealth poster and, um, and, uh, and other examples. Um, but basically, you know, just know if you make a collab with the things that you want and you put it up and you see it often and you bless it with the words from highest source for highest good, wonderful things can happen. Thank you very much.